This bike has been overindulged with loads of desirable factory optional extras that have made an already good looking bike even more desirable. The fact that it cuts such a dashing figure is undoubtedly helping me to feel warm and gooey about it, but right now I'm getting all emotionally connected because of the much more important part of motorcycling, the actual riding experience. A respectable but by no means large amount of horsepower and a simple virtually unnoticeable electronic safety net and a basic but very accomplished suspension and chassis setup are the perfect ingredients for these Spanish roads on a sunny winter's day although I have to say the sudden drop in temperature today means the roads seem to have been covered in a fine layer of I was gonna say dust but I think it's the anti-icing that they've been using whatever it is the grip definitely isn't what it was yesterday still the sun's out, I haven't got hypothermia yet. Life is good. Given what I'm about to say, I think it's worth mentioning that if I ever suggest that anything less than say 180 horsepower is actually more than enough power, then a certain usually youthful section of the audience is gonna go, he uh, doesn't know what he's talking about. He hasn't got the bottle anymore. He's getting old. Well, apart from the wounded pride, <laughs> cobblers to all that, age may temper the risk-taking side of your brain a little bit, but that's more than offset by 30 years of road riding experience, as far as I'm concerned. And as any older person will tell you, what is that by the way? Anyone over the age of 35 these days? Anyway, they'll explain to you that wisdom grows as the years stack up. All of which basically means, yeah, I'm gonna say a 109 horsepower naked bike is plenty fast enough in a setting like this. And you hardcore sport riders can bring your 200 horsepower hyper nakeds and super bikes if you can afford them, and you'll still struggle to leave me on these wickedly twisty mountain roads on this little beauty. Right, now that I've dealt with my <laughs> very obvious middle-aged insecurities, let's get back to the riding. But first off, I just want to say that having travelled this past couple of weeks in Spain on over a thousand kilometres of minor back roads, I have to say I'm super impressed with the quality of them. Smooth, well maintained, lovely cambers. They absolutely embarrass the Italians. They show up the Germans and the Brits. They're almost on a par with the class leading French. Yeah, very impressed indeed. And when they're good, they're really good. Like this stretch I'm on now that is in a better condition than most of the race circuits we have in SA. Having said that, a lot of this R90's appeal though is about how it makes you feel when you're not even riding it because it's so damn cool. I get that, I really do. But move past the looks, delve a little deeper and you find a really excellent sport bike that just happens not to have a fairing. This is a middle-aged athlete that's every bit as agile and sprightly as any youthful influencer, yet it has the good looks of a really classy silver fox. Bit like myself, really. Minus the uh, good looks and 
athleticism. <laughs> this is one of those bikes though, especially when it's smothered in all these 719 optional extras that you can happily stare at and prod and poke to your heart's content. In a world of look-alike, amorphous bikes, this is just, it's, it's grown up, it's classy, distinguished. Like a fine ale, it probably helps to be of a certain age to really appreciate it. This model originally appeared in 2014 and it received its first really major update last year. In terms of looks, that doesn't mean much. This is still the same simple, clean line, good looking bike it was, but now with LED lights and indicators, some updated clocks that keep the integrated LCD display and USB charging point, and they now show a bit more info for those of you interested in that kind of thing. There's still a set of fat 46 mm upside down forks up front when the rest of the range wears right way uppers. And these excellent Brembo brakes also remain with their big 320 mm discs. The engine has had some minor fiddling to keep it the right side of the latest emissions regulations. The result is one horsepower lost, but the peak now arrives a little earlier. Basically, it spews less nasty stuff, but the performance hasn't suffered. And while we're on the subject of the motor, let me just point out that this is the oil and air-cooled version of the 1170cc Boxer that they had before they threw water cooling at it and made it more powerful. And I tell you what, it's a perfect fit for this job. As standard, you get two riding modes, road and rain, but this has the optional dynamic, which sharpens up the throttle response even more. It's still so predictable, so measured, that I don't see you ever needing to use either of the other modes, even in the midst of a hurricane. I nearly broke my toe when I picked this bike up from BMW in Madrid, because I assumed wrongly, as it turns out, that it would have a quick shifter but it doesn't. It's not even option, uh, offered as an option, apparently. And you know what? I'm kind of glad that it isn't. Even after a few hundred kilometers of riding, I'm not missing it. I've really actually quite enjoyed being forced back into the old school way of doing things by finessing throttle and clutch. And even at times, if you want to do a clutchless shift, you can do. You just got to time it perfectly. And also, you have to bear in mind that it doesn't have a slipper clutch or anything like it. So if you want to brake hard and mash the brakes, scrub off a load of speed, then you've got to time everything pretty well or else it gets it bouncing and hopping around a little bit. But when you do get it right, oh, it feels lovely. More tech would undoubtedly make it easier to ride, but it would then be less rewarding to ride well, if you know what I mean. ASC, which is a basic traction control system, and cornering ABS are standard, and that's about it as far as your electronic safety net goes. I've already had the chance to appreciate the traction control. It has saved me as I've been in and out of the shady, damp parts of these mountain roads when the sun hasn't yet completely dried everything out. When it comes to the extras, I'm the sort of journalist who normally says, take the most basic version of a model and save yourself some dosh. But for this, I say, empty your bank account, borrow as much money as possible and blow it on every 719 option you can get your hands on. Why? Well, just look at it. It's um, sumptuous. Does that cover it? Option 719 apparently was used back in the day to denote special projects carried out in the Berlin factory. And now they've used it to describe their range of juicy bits for the current models. And they really are very juicy indeed. Where to start? Well, overall, it's just a nicely proportioned bike. And then there's the red frame. 
a very simple but equally very striking option. After that we have all the other delicious bits and bobs on this bike that have come from the 719 options list, all of them serving no great dynamic function apart from maybe the rear sets, but all of them add an extra level of class to a bike that is, after all, very much about the visuals. Adjustable levers, those rear sets, billet pieces everywhere you look, special paint and all this on top of a bike that already features some quality pieces of engineering around the seat subframe and the front mug guard that has a needlessly yet gratefully accepted aluminium mount. Indicators, lights, handlebar and risers and triple clamps and 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 numerous little details that make you fall in love with a bike beautiful to the touch, beautiful when examined closely or taken in from afar. The 719 options are obviously crafted by engineers who love what they do and they will be appreciated by anyone who loves quality design. All of that undoubted loveliness would just be pointless trinkets though if the riding experience wasn't up to scratch. But thankfully, whether you've got all the expensive jewellery on it or not, this is a lovely rider's bike. The handling is light and responsive. It's eager to, thankfully, <laughs> dive into a corner. And it just gives you plenty of feedback, always finding grip corner entry, mid turn, it's lovely and on the exit combined with that lovely peachy grunty motor even though as I said earlier the roads are a bit a little bit dicey today and it's very cold, it's only about 7 degrees you don't have too many worries about finding grip no doubt about it this is a hugely entertaining bike it's playful by nature and it's oozing character at a time when many bikes, understandably I suppose, just seem to be plastic, fantastic bikes made for the PlayStation generation. I'm hesitant to say that this retro is old school because, let's face it, underneath it all it's still a very modern machine. But it manages to combine the retro looks and the simple riding pleasures with technology in just the right way. I'm sold, I really am. I first rode this model back at the end of 2014 or early 2015, I think it was, and I remember liking it, but eight years later, the feelings I have for this bike are now much stronger. I love it, and since the bike hasn't really changed all that much, I have to assume it's me who's tastes have developed, or should I say improved, with a few more years under my belt, a bit more wisdom gained, an appreciation for the finer things in life, a greater respect for engineering details and analogue sensations, if you catch my drift, I'm in a position to fully appreciate the combination of attributes that the R9T offers. It doesn't hurt, of course, that the roads around here are perfect for a bike like this and the sun is shining, but then they're the sort of attributes that improve any bike. Nope, there's simply no getting away from it. This is a truly lovely bike. Quite expensive, but undeniably lovely. Lovely. <laughs> Isn't the word lovely just lovely? <laughs> yeah, I think I... I got hooked on a, on a word there. It happens occasionally when I try and ride and talk at the same time. I'm not smart enough to do both properly. I apologise and I'll get stuck into a thesaurus before the next test. And I suppose I should also apologise about my selfishness in taking up so much time to talk about a single bike. I do usually like to try and remain at least a, a little dispassionate and coolly objective when I review a bike, but this one just got under my skin straight away. This was a fantastic few days of riding and I know the superb roads and the perfect, if still cold, winter weather undoubtedly swayed my opinion, but still the R90 looks a treat, sounds sweet, rides like a dream, makes you feel brilliant all around really. 
The engine may be an older generation boxer, but with 116 newton meters of torque, that's more than a Yamaha R1, just for some perspective. It is easily up to the job of being plenty enough engine to have a lot of fun with and to surprise a few modern sport bike riders along the way. And there's other little things that the nerdy biker in me loves. The mirrors, for instance, not only are they lovely things to look at, they're equally lovely to look in because they give you a great view behind you, which if you're a biker, you'll know is not a given these days. And on top of that, they provide a crystal clear image, even when you're giving it some, way up past the 180k an hour mark. Oh, by the way, just be aware that this is one of those naked bikes that does not provide a surprising amount of wind protection despite the lack of a fairing or a screen. It's windy, so be prepared to lose the use of your neck after a day's riding. You'll be looking around like this, you know what it's like. The brakes are still Brembo's, I notice, when many BMW models are going the Hayes route these days, and this isn't a dig at them at all, but these are brilliant. Great power, delicate feel at the lever, excellent. And then there's the price, which is pretty expensive, even in standard trim, but worth it, I say, when you see the quality of its construction and the depths of the riding pleasure that it offers. In absolute basic trim, I, I don't know to tell you the truth, BMW South Africa is only listing the predecessor model at 240,000 Rand. The new model is bound to be a little bit more expensive, and then there's the many tens of thousands of Rand's worth of 719 options that are, truth be told, nice to have, but hardly necessary to enjoy a seriously capable bike. BMW's R90 is one of, if not the first of, the big manufacturer's efforts at a retro model. It is now better than ever. I think it qualifies as a genuinely great bike. And please believe me, I do not use such hyperbole lightly. Time for some ads. 